In this video, we are going to talk about the capital asset pricing model and arbitrage pricing theory, CAP M and APT. Let's go over some of the assumptions in the capital asset pricing model. Uh, one area of assumptions is investor behavior. We must assume that investors are rational, mean variance optimizers. Uh, that's one way to say that we prefer higher returns and lower risk. Their common planning horizon is a single period. Uh, where there's three months, one year, the point is that you do plan, you do a plan for the three months or the year or the six months or the 10 years for that matter. And then you start over again, the planning. Investors all use identical input lists. That means everybody has the same information. Uh, an assumption often term homogeneous expectations. Homogeneous expectations are consistent with the assumption that all relevant information is publicly available. This is part of the mark, uh, efficient market hypothesis. Market structure. We assume that all assets are publicly held and trade on public exchanges. In other words, for this cap and to work, it has to be only with the assets that are publicly traded uh, for any comparison or measurement. Investors can borrow or lend at a common risk-free rate. That would be like your government bonds. And they can take short positions on traded securities. So shorting is allowed in trading. No taxes. Now, you're probably thinking right now, but we do have taxes. That's fine. But for the comparisons that we that we use, we compare them before taxes. You can make then a more detailed comparison after taxes. No transaction costs. Now that assumption is very real now. Ever since uh, uh, things like Robinhood and other platforms came out where there's no transaction costs, uh, that's uh, that's definitely a plus. An assumption that can be is becoming more and more valid. Before what we did, we just treated like taxes. Yes, we know they exist, but for the initial calculations and comparisons, we don't apply them, then we can add these. The capital asset pricing model, uh, we have a hypothetical equilibrium that have to be taken into consideration. Uh, we assume that all investors choose to hold the market portfolio, like this part of their investment strategy. Uh, market portfolio is on the efficient frontier and the optimal risky portfolio. This is related to the uh, capital allocation line and the capital market line. Hypothetical equilibrium, risk premium of market portfolio is proportional to variance of market portfolio and investors risk aversion. In other words, risk premium, remember, is what you get on top of the risk-free rate in order to compensate for the risk that you're taking because the risk-free rate is the return you get with zero risk. Risk premium on individual assets, proportional to risk premium on market portfolio. This is, this is now talking closer to beta. So for example, we use beta to compare the riskiness of an asset in proportion to the market portfolio, proportional to beta coefficient of security of market portfolio. Passive strategy is efficient. You may have heard of passive management and active management. Passive management, you do your plan, you set your weights, your portfolios, and you let it sit, I guess to say it that way, and you just come back after your time period or from time to time, to revise the situation. And if you have to do some rebalancing, you do, but it's uh, far few apart as it compared to active management where they're consistently in every possible opportunity to rebalance the portfolio, to take advantages of changes in the market. So passive strategy is efficient. Mutual fund theorem, all investors desire same portfolio of risky assets can be satisfied by single mutual fund composed of that portfolio. So there's no real need, what they're saying in that, uh, uh, on that bullet, 
to then go into a lot of different portfolios. Once you have your risk return goal, you should be able to create a, a portfolio mutual fund that satisfies that. If passive strategy is costless and efficient, why follow active strategy? Well, that is a good question. And you hear it all the time. Companies advertising their active strategies and how they'll perform this, how they do that. Uh, as of right now, and it will be discussed in, in another chapter, there's very little evidence that active strategy outperforms passive on the long run. If no one does security analysis, what well, brings about efficiency of market portfolio? Uh, so you've heard of analysts and they're out there constantly analyzing and making decisions. But if there were no security analysis, what well, brings about efficiency uh, of market portfolio? Well, we're not going to get too deep in there, but uh, signal theory comes in play or as uh, as the market fluctuates, and uh, uh, people will adjust accordingly. There's an equilibrium that can be met. Economic forces come in play, but that's for a different course. But these are questions that, uh, that come up when talking about the capital assets pricing model, which is a very technical analysis approach, not necessarily fundamental. Risk premium of market portfolio. Demand drives prices lowers expected rate of return, risk premiums. So the more demand there is for something, just like good old economics, the prices may go down, may go up. If the demand goes down, the prices go down. When premiums fall, investors move funds into risk-free assets. So if the stock market is going down, People will typically will then get out of the stock market and go into bonds. And the reason is because the returns are becoming smaller and smaller to where that excess return, that additional return you get for the risk above the risk-free asset becomes less worth it. Then when the market turns again, people jump out of their risk-free assets and go into the, the stock market again. Equilibrium risk premium of market portfolio proportional to risk of the market. Makes sense because it is the equilibrium risk premium of market portfolio, risk aversion of the average investor. Back to what we mentioned earlier about rational behavior or investors are rational. Rationality says that we should be risk averse. So now to the formula of the capital asset pricing model, CAPM. Now, here they say that CAPM gives you the expected return of individual securities. Under this context, it's okay to say that. However, I want to bring up that under different contexts, we use required return for the CAPM formula instead of expected return, because then we want to compare it to the expected return as in the historical return moving in the future or maybe some fundamental analysis were done. Maybe some economic downturns or upturns are expected in the future or in the near future. So at that point, when we're comparing expectations versus requirements, we call the CAPM the required return and the expected returns what we expect to really happen. But for now, it's okay. But just understand that if you start seeing in other areas, CAPM called the required return versus the expected return is because of that point we're trying to differentiate two different talk, two different uh, things in order to compare them. The security market line. And you know what? I'm going to go to the next slide and then I'll come back to this one. The CAPM formula gives you this chart, this graph. 1.0 is your market portfolio. That's what you see the M there. And this example is returning 14%. These are your returns. These are your betas. And then depending on the beta of the asset, whether it's a portfolio or individual stock, it will fall out somewhere on this line. This alpha you see here, if by any chance this portfolio or fund or stock was required to return 15.6 or expected to return 15.6, but it turns out they return 17%, then it gives a little abnormal returns there, and that's alpha. That is similar to Jensen Alpha, something we speak in a different chapter. 
Okay, so this formula creates this chart. So now back to the slide, the security market line, SML, they are talking about this red line right here, security markets line, represents expected return beta relationship to cap M, expected return to the beta, graphs individual asset risk premiums as function of asset risk. Alpha, abnormal rate of return on security in excess of that predicted by Calirium model. That's that alpha we spoke about here. Now, alpha could be negative and still be called abnormal. Let's say it was down here. So you have a negative alpha. It's still abnormal. It's just in the other direction. Applications of the capital asset pricing model. Uh, you can use SML as benchmark for fair return on risky assets. So you calculate your expected returns or required returns, and that's your benchmark. And then when you take your positions and the actual returns come about, you can go ahead and compare them to see how you performed according to your estimation. SML provides hurdle rate for internal projects. Uh, this is later as we talk about things like weighted average cost of capital and other ways to calculate the net present value of a project. Uh, but yes, it does that. Uh, that can be used, the required return or expected return for uh, evaluating projects as part of the discount rate. Hurdle rate and discount rate can be used interchangeably. Happen in the real world. Well, like everything, nothing is perfect. So CAPM does have its flaws. So where they're saying CAPM is false based on validity of its assumptions, they're just saying that, well, CAPM is as good as its assumptions. So it's a useful predictor of expected returns. It has proven over time to have a decent uh, uh, predicting ability. Now it is untestable as a theory. Uh, I guess the expression I've heard used before is a self-fulfilling prophecy, but I cannot be tested as a theory. Uh, principles are still valid. Uh, investors should diversify regardless. Uh, systematic risk is the risk that matters. As I just mentioned, when you diversify, unsystematic risk is negligible. So systematic risk is really what matters if you do proper diversification. A well-diversified risky portfolio can be suitable for a wide range of investors. So as long as you're well-diversified, you can go up and down the efficient frontier and you'll find something that is suitable for most investors. Now, let's talk about this multi-factor model as NCAPM. So this FAMA French three-factor model is, I like to call it, a, think of it as somewhat of a, of a CAPM on steroids. What they did was they added some more factors to the formula to control for small versus big companies, high versus low, and in, in, in sense of uh, returns and, and size. Point is that this formula performs a little better than cap M. You get a higher adjusted R square. So there's more explanation in the variability. You get a lower residual standard deviation. So the less standard error. And you have a smaller value at alpha. So your intercept is lower. However, let's look at the numbers. Here's an example of when they tested uh, through a regression, the, what we call the single index model. So it's just the market premium, right? There's a regression that only has the market premium as one of the variables. That would be this piece in here, okay? And what comes out is this number and this number. We'll talk about those in a moment. So they run a regression with this as the dependent variable. And they run one with just this in here. So you will get an intercept and a coefficient. And then they don't have these. Then they ran another regression where they added the SMB and the HML variable in order to compare them. So as mentioned before, it is true that the alpha, the intercept, was a little lower. The lower the alpha, 
uh, the better because then there's uh, less uncertainty. However, the T stat is very weak. So while it is true that this one gave us a better alpha, it's a really, really, really weak difference between these two. So it's not that great of an improvement. Now we look at the next variable. This one gave us two different numbers, but what we're looking at is here, this T statistic. This one is slightly higher than this one, meaning that this number has a little more value as a predictor than this one. However, is not that great of a difference between 6.46 and 6.61. First, because 6.46 is our really high T stat. So there's like 99.99999% uh, confidence. And this was just slightly more. So the difference between the power of these two, it's so, so small. So the advantage is very little. Then these, these don't exist here because it was not part of the regression. regression. These are the control variables. These helped improve these two numbers. But as I mentioned, they're not really that great of a difference. Not only the coefficient itself is not that great of a difference, but the power is not that much different either. Here, these T stats are too low. Uh, they're higher than this one, but they're still low enough to make these not that valuable as a predictor. The R square is just slightly higher from 0.419 to 0.422. And the residual standard deviation is just slightly lower from 3.91 to 3.90. Now, the message that I'm trying to get to that, yes, it is true, these numbers are a little better, but it's so small the difference that people typically just continue with a single index model because it's a lot easier to collect the data, organize it, and get the numbers you need then going through the extended process, because these two variables takes uh, a whole different set of calculations that you have to add to the process. So this is a more costly process, to put it that way, than this one, and it doesn't improve that much. Now, some may argue that in the very large numbers, billions and trillions of dollars, it can make a difference. Yes, that's true. Um, I'm just saying is that a lot of people stick with this one because of the simplicity and the speed you can do it and still get a good enough number depending on what you're doing. So yes, it's better. But how much better that people argue that is not worth it. Arbitrage. Let's talk about arbitrage pricing theory. So we're just going to touch on some basics here. We talk more about it on the Excel sheets and other chapters. But arbitrage is just relative mispricing creates riskless profit. So Everything has its intrinsic value and it will be reflected on the price. However, it's rarely in that spot, sometimes a little higher, a little lower because of other market forces or what the market is adjusting as it goes. So when you find things that are what we call mispriced uh, relative to other assets in the market, you can take advantage by, uh, of that. And by risk less profit, they mean that you don't have to put any of your money. Some of the strategies, what you do is you short one of the assets and then you use the money that you collect from the short position and you take your, your a long position on another asset. One of those two is going to be mispriced. How you choose to short or long, that's in a different uh, uh, video. But the point is that you short one, take the cash from the short, use it to get a long position, let the averages pl uh, play out, meaning the mispriced asset will eventually go back to its proper pricing. And when those changes happen, you go ahead and collect profits while covering any potential losses, and you maintain some of that cash with you. But the point is you never put any of your cash in. You use the cash from the short position. That's one example of uh, ways to create arbitrage. Now, the arbitrage pricing theory, uh, risk-return relationships from no arbitrage considerations in large capital markets. This is more like a definition, but it's, it's talking about these uh, pricing relationships and risk return. So when we say mispricing, we're saying that something is off on the risk-return relationship. That's one way to look at it. So if something is off or is not where it's supposed to be, let's say according to CAPM, for example, then 
you may have a mispriced situation. You might be able to take advantage of that in arbitrage. Uh, some notes on well diversified portfolio. Non-systematic risk, risk is negligible. When you diversify portfolio properly, the non-systematic risk goes down and all you're left is with systematic risk. Uh, arbitrage portfolio uh, goes back. If you have a portfolio that is diversified, but then some mispricing may happen, you can the mispricing that I spoke about could be stocks or it could be portfolios. So you could do arbitrage with portfolios as well, as long as something is mispriced. Uh, diversified portfolio, positive return, zero net investment, risk-free portfolio. So the zero net, in, you get a positive return when I was talking about that strategy with a zero net investment. As I explained, you can use the cash that came in from the short position and use it on your long position. And what you do is, a what you have is a risk-free position. You didn't put any investment of your money. And that is it for today's video. See you on the next one.